Okay, I've pressed record. So hopefully, yes, I think we are recording. That's good. Um, okay, that's it. In terms of questions, I will try to monitor, I'm not, no, I'm not even gonna say that. I'm not gonna be able to monitor the chat and give the talk at the same time. But if you do have a question, I don't mind being interrupted at all. So uh, put your mic on and talk over top of me until I hear you. And I'm happy to answer questions like during my, during my seminar. Okay, so this is, I'm starting off on the wrong slide. So this is not great. I'll go back to the beginning and get my laser pointer. Okay, now I'm ready. <laughs> All right, so I, I've changed the topic of my talk a little bit from when the notice went out at the end of August. Um, recognizing that, you know, we're all tired of Zoom meetings and that for some reason, Zoom seminars seem to be about double the time that regular seminars are. Um, I'm cutting out this respiration piece of my talk uh, just to, to keep it hopefully to 40 to 45 minutes. So there's time for questions after. And what I'm going to do is just in the first part of my talk, I'm going to sort of give you a 20,000 foot overview of um, what my lab's doing, what they've been doing for the last 20 years. And then for the last part of the talk, I'm going to completely switch gears and talk about a brand new research direction that was started by uh, a single trainee in the lab. Um, and that I'm, I'm thrilled to say we just got NSERC funding to study for the next five years. So I'll tell you a smaller story at the end and kind of give you a, a big picture overview at the beginning. I like thank yous and I like to start with thank yous and I like to have thank yous through my talk and I like to have thank yous at the end. So I'll start with thanking my group right now in my lab. Um, my grad students, Val Spicklis, Justin Bishop, Kat Pick, who you'll hear more about later, Tim Cho and Ashley Gilliland. Uh, research associate Brent Weber, and this is a 499 student Ayushi Patel from last year. Um, and I want to thank all of these guys. I know they're not here, but they have been fantastic throughout the pandemic and worked together like such a good team. And that has just made life so much easier. So I want to thank them. And of course, all of these um, funders that have provided um, money for our research program. Okay. So um, the fundamental question that I've been interested in for my whole career is understanding how bacteria sense and adapt to environmental changes. And as we know, um, bacteria can be found in many, many, many diverse environments. They've been found in virtually every environment that people have looked for them in. And so the microbes that inhabit those diverse environments are as diverse as those environments. And we've even found microbes in places that we previously thought were sterile for um, all of time, essentially. Uh, our favorite bacteria in my lab is Escherichia coli, which is a natural inhabitant of the mammalian intestine. And this um, topic of the, this idea of sensing and adaptation is really relevant to um, E. coli and bacteria that habit this, inhabit this niche because they can be exposed to so many different potential stressors and changes in the environment during their life cycle. So while E. coli, e. coli is normally in our intestine, it can be shed, of course. And when it is shed, it can survive in water, in the environment, in agricultural settings, in our food to cause problems. Um, and then it can be re-ingested and it can withstand um, just massive changes in different environmental signals throughout the gastrointestinal tract to recolonize the intestine. So throughout our GI tract, there are dramatic changes in uh, temperature, in nutrients, in pH, um, in the concentration of oxygen in osmolarity. There are um, immune molecules in cells like bile and uh, reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, antimicrobial peptides. Um, and of course, there are many, many microbes in and on our bodies, as well as the bacterial viruses or bacteriophage that um, reside within them and can be released um, to give microbes a competitive advantage. And this is what I'll be talking about towards the end of my talk this afternoon. So all of these environmental changes impact the envelope first. And in gram-negative bacteria, the envelope consists of uh, two modified lipid bilayers, 
that surround a soluble uh, paraplasmic compartment um, where the cell wall resides, which is made of peptidoglycan, of course. So in all of the slides that I'm gonna to show today where I have the envelope diagrammed, the cytoplasm will be at the bottom, the outside of the cell will be at the top. Um, a little more about this compartment because this has been the focus of, of my lab's work for a long time. Um, the, the, it's bounded by these two membranes, the inner membrane or cytoplasmic membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer and the outer membrane, which contains phospholipids on the cell-facing side, and then this modified lipid called lipopolysaccharide or LPS that coats the outside of the cell. Um, this whole compartment, the paraplasm and both membranes, are very dense with all kinds of proteins. So we have inner membrane proteins that are rich with transmembrane alpha helices, we have beta barrel proteins, which are unique to bacteria, mitochondria, and chloroplasts um, in the outer membrane. And then we have um, lipoproteins that contain um, n acyl modifications at their end termini that anchor them either in the outer membrane or the inner membrane. There are many soluble proteins in the periplasm, and there are many proteins that are linked to this peptidoglycan cell wall. So it's a pretty complex compartment. Um, but not only is it, is it complex in terms of how many proteins and, and um, different molecules it contains, uh, bacteria regularly modify this compartment. So it's quite plastic. And in response to environmental stressors, changes in metabolites, um, bacteria have the capacity to change the content of the proteins, the polysaccharides in this compartment to adapt to whatever environment they're facing. So this is the um, adaptive response that my lab has spent most of the 20 year, most of the last 20 years studying. It's called the CPX envelope stress response. And we study it mostly in E. coli, although in a few other um, organisms as well. And I'll just tell you for interest and trivia sake, CPX stands for conjugative pillus expression. And that's because the first um, mutations that were characterized that affected this signaling system altered the expression of the, the conjugate of pilus on E. coli that's responsible for horizontal gene transfer between bacteria. So this is the response that we study, and it is a response to stresses to the envelope. And it's regulated by a two component system that's made up of a sensor kinase in the inner or cytoplasmic membrane and a response regulator in the cytoplasm. And what we know about this pathway is that um, many, many stresses that cause protein misfolding um, turn on the signaling between CPXA and CPXR, and they trigger an autophosphorylation of this histidine kinase, followed by transfer of this phosphate to an aspartate on the response regulator CPXR. Uh, and phosphorylation of CPXR then confers on it the ability to act as a transcription factor. And it turns on a number of genes that encode proteases, chaperones, and others that I'll talk about in a moment that are localized to the envelope and help mediate adaptation to this protein misfolding stress. So I should mention also that CPXA functions as a phosphatase as well. So in the absence of protein misfolding or envelope stress, it has the capacity to remove phosphate from CPXR and maintain this pathway in an off state. Okay, so I think it's um, important to mention for later in the talk that two component signaling is really ubiquitous in bacteria. It's a major way that microbes sense and respond to their environment. Um, so this is just, again, a diagram of a typical two component system with a sensor kinase that contains a, a paraplasmic um, sensing domain outside of the cytoplasm and a cognate response regulator. And a given microbe can have multiple of these two component systems. So in E. coli, I think there are 34, but the number of systems generally correlates with the complexity of the environment that the microbe inhabits. So soil microbes are, are notorious for having really a ton of these signaling pathways. And it's thought that they each recognize a unique signal um, and in response to that signal lead to changes in the expression of adaptive genes that are specific to that signal. 
So I should also say that the CPX envelope stress response, although it was one of the first and probably is one of the best characterized envelope stress responses in bacteria, um, it is only one of at least five in E. coli. And as with two component signal transduction systems, there are varying numbers of envelope stress response pathways um, found in different microbes, again, depending on the kinds of environments they inhabit. Um, what they all share in common is that they have a, a membrane bound sensor protein that's able to detect some change in physiology in the environment. Um, and they all, we think, detect some, some unique aspect of envelope physiology or disruptions to that, that piece of envelope physiology. Um, and in response to those changes, then there's a transduction event that, again, leads to changes in the expression of genes that mediate adaptation to that particular envelope stress. So the pathway that I'm mostly talking about today and that we've mostly worked on is the CPX response on the left here. And we have a lot of, um, a lot of studies have led us to the conclusion that a main component of the signal this, this sensor CPXA detects is misfolded proteins, although we still haven't really nailed the molecular mechanism down behind that. Um, and in response, of course, it upregulates chaperones and proteases. But there are also many other pathways. So for example, this RCS pathway over here on the right, which will come up later, it's also, it's regulated by a, a modified two component system, but it's been shown that it works in cooperation with an outer membrane protein complex to detect damage to LPS, and it can also detect damage to the cell wall. And in response, it regulates production of a, of a polysaccharide capsule that coats the surface of the cell and protects it from those stresses. Okay, and so similarly, these other envelope stress responses recognize other stresses to the envelope and induce different adaptive responses. Okay, so before I get into the, the, the smaller story that I want to tell you guys about today, like I said, I just want to um, give you an overview of sort of what we've been working on for most of my career here. Um, and we've essentially kind of gone at this from two angles. So we're very interested in understanding the adaptations conferred by this pathway, and we've done a lot of work on that end. But as I just mentioned, we also are really interested in understanding how this signaling event happens. And, and this is a, still a pretty wide open area in this two component signal transduction field, even though these regulators have been known now for, for quite a long time. So on the, the response, the adaptation side, we've done a number of transcriptomic studies. Uh, and I've tried to kind of diagram the outcome of those in this little bacterial cell at the bottom here. Um, essentially what we've shown is that the CPX response does not only um, lead to changes and upregulation of proteases and chaperones in the envelope to deal with this misfolded protein um, signal, it also regulates the expression of um, many membrane associated proteins. So proteins that are involved in transport across the cytoplasmic membrane, um, protein complexes involved in efflux of wastes and toxins from the cell, um, protein complexes that work in um, uh, iron homeogenesis or homeostasis, uh, proteins involved in respiration and metabolism at the membrane, um, and these multi-protein envelope complexes that consist of many proteins localized across all compartments of the envelope. But what all of these um, regulated, hundreds of regulated genes um, are enriched for are proteins that are found in the cytoplasmic membrane. And that's what I'm just trying to show in this table from our paper where we basically did a functional cluster analysis of transcriptome genes and showed that um, by far the biggest enrichment amongst all the different categories of um, CPX regulated genes we looked at in different medias and different strains were membrane, inner membrane or cytoplasmic membrane associated proteins. Um, and this is just, uh, again, a diagram demonstrating this, this group of protein folding and degrading factors, um, some of the ones that are CPX regulated, including this protease steak P, these inner membrane proteases, HTPX and FTSH, that um, are capable of removing stalled uh, translocation complexes from the membrane, um, and a number of other chaperones, including CPXP that's shown here working with DIGP. 
Okay, so one of the things I hypothesized actually in my job interview at the U of A, which I think was the last time that I gave a seminar to the faculty in the department, which is sort of terrifying. Um, I, I, I had hypothesized that because the CPX envelope stress response regulated these proteases and chaperones, that perhaps it played a role in regulating the virulence of bacterial pathogens and their ability to cause infection. And the reason for arguing this is that many, most, potentially all in some cases, of the virulence determinants expressed by pathogenic gram-negative microbes involve the assembly of protein complexes that span the gram-negative envelope. So on this slide, I'm just showing you a cross-section of the kinds of um, virulence determinants I'm talking about here. So for example, pathogens uh, express flagella to help them be modal and move to sites of colonization and infection. They express a number of machineries that span the envelope that secrete virulence determinants like homolysins, proteases, and toxins. Um, and they also make um, envelope spanning protein complexes um, that make pili that help pathogens um, stick to cells in their host at colonization and infection sites. So this is something that we have worked a lot on in my lab over the years. And um, we have worked predominantly with pathogenic strains of E. coli and Vibrio cholera to show that yes, if you alter the activity of the CPX envelope stress response and therefore the levels of these protein biogenesis factors, you do impact the expression of virulence determinants like secretion systems and pili in pathogenic strains of E. coli and in Vibrio cholera. Um, and others have gone on to show that this is the case in many other gram-negative pathogens at all as well, including Salmonella enterica shown here. And I have to move your faces if I wanna see the other organism behind you. Oh, it's Yersinia, I remembered. Um, so we, we know this is kind of a generalizable thing now that this response modifying the activity of this envelope stress response alters virulence determinant uh, expression and, and therefore infection. Another area that we've worked on is um, related to antimicrobials, um, which again, I'll be talking about shortly. Um, and so many, many antimicrobials, um, classic clinically used antibiotics, but also antimicrobial compounds produced by hosts like bile and antimicrobial peptides and antimicrobial compounds produced by other competing microbes, like these bactericin toxins, like bacteriophage, um, like these type six secretion systems that are used to inject toxic effectors into competing microbes. Um, all of these target the bacterial envelope. And there's been now a lot of research in my group and other groups showing that again, if you modify the activity of the CPX envelope stress response, you impact resistance to these different antimicrobial compounds. Um, and this is, I think, actually has some important clinical significance because this is true in members of the escape group of pathogens that um, have been highlighted by the World Health Organization as infectious disease causing uh, bacteria that have acquired resistance to many of the clinically used antibiotics that we, that we use today. And so um, on that list are Enterobacter species, um, Klebsiella and Pseudomonas. And this is just a partial list of um, bacterial pathogens where my group or others have looked at the impact of altering the CPX response on resistance to different antibiotics that are used in the clinic. Okay, so that's the one side that we're interested in is sort of what are the adaptations conferred by this response. Um, the other side that we've been really interested in studying is the signaling side. And um, really, as I mentioned earlier in two component signal transduction, um, this is still a bit of a mystery how these sensor proteins detect these unique signals and what the molecular mechanisms are behind um, their ability to sense different signals and, and transduce those into uh, uh, a, trans a transduction event. Um, so we've taken the approach with the CPX response, kind of a two-pronged approach 
Um, one thing that we've done is we've looked for proteins that interact with this sensor kinase to begin to understand signaling complexes. We've identified a, a novel chaperone in the paraplasm called CPXP that's involved in regulating sensor kinase activity when the pathway is off. Um, and we've shown that this novel lipoprotein NLPE, which resides at the outer membrane, um, interacts with OMP-A and that this complex is important for interacting with CPXA and for um, transducing a signal that results from adherence of E. coli to a solid surface. The other thing we've done on the signaling side is we've with our longtime collaborator, Mark Glover in biochemistry, we've been trying to solve the crystal structure of these signaling proteins. And so this is the crystal structure of CPXP that we solved some time ago now. Um, and down here is the crystal structure of the CPXA sensing domain. Uh, and this work has allowed us to identify um, ligand binding sites um, and to look at how those interact with some of these other proteins and some of the signals that we know induce this pathway. Okay, so before I leave this topic behind to um, move on to a, a new story, I just want to, um, I think I've kind of already done this, but I just want to position it kind of in terms of the greater significance of, of my research in terms of application or potential translation. And I am very loath to bring up public health emergencies right now. But um, there was this report out of the UK in 2014, which predicted that by the year 2050, um, more people would die from infection with antimicrobial resistant bacteria than um, from cancer. So let's just acknowledge that fact and leave it behind because we have one pandemic on our hands. But what I will say is that I think our characterization of the CPX response and its adaptations, um, as well as the identification of the biogenesis machineries in the envelope that are responsible for that plasticity and for modifying the envelope in response to environmental changes, um, these signaling pathways and these biogenesis machineries have all been validated recently in the literature as targets for the development of, of novel therapeutics to treat um, gram-negative bacterial infections. And so I'm, I'm excited to see where that goes in the coming years. So far, nothing has come out of this yet um, in terms of clinical trials, but there, there are real efforts in this area right now. Okay, so I told you that I'm big on thank yous. So I just, um, you know how you go to seminars and you see people give talks and, and they, they summarize the, the research of a PhD student on one slide and you see that happen all the time and, and, and people apologize. So I've just summarized basically the research of all the trainees that have passed through my lab <laughs> in the last 20 years in, in about, uh, I don't know, six or seven slides. So I'm not going to read their names out, but I'm just going to acknowledge them here with their pictures and say that um, I am super proud of them, and they are all amazing um, people that have gone on to, to do uh, uh, amazing things. And so I'll say thank you, even though they're not here. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears now um, and talk to you about a current story in the lab that is sort of changing our direction. And it starts with this 2014 paper out of my colleague Mark Goulian's lab um, in Pennsylvania. So this, this paper described uh, a new commensal strain of E. coli called MP1 that Mark's lab isolated out of um, a mouse intestine from mouse feces. And the reason why I was excited about this is um, that although you know, E. coli is one of the best genetic model organisms in the world, and we have a gajillion resources to study it. And we have learned so much about microbial and cell physiology from it. Um, there aren't really great ways to study what all of those things mean in nature, in the natural environment of E. coli um, where it lives. So we've spent a lot of time studying pathogens, pathogens of E. coli, but also Vibrio cholera. And there are animal models of infection for those pathogens, but um, they all have problems that, you know, they don't mimic the human um, infectious disease situation well. Similarly with E. coli K12, 
Um, you know, we, we are so lucky, as I said, to have all these tools to study it, but E. coli K12, and, and especially the varieties that are used commonly in labs, is incredibly domesticated to the point where it, it can't live in an intestine anymore. Um, and we also know that it, it is, is not a good representative of kind of a, an E. coli from nature from our transcriptome studies. So when we compare you know, the envelope stress response from uh, you know, our laboratory MG1655 E. coli to a, you know, a pathogenic E. coli that more recently came out of an animal, we see that you know, the E. coli that more recently came out of an animal has a much richer, more sensitive envelope stress response than our domesticated E. coli K12. So I was really excited about this paper because it sort of represents, I think, a way that we can apply all the knowledge that we've acquired about signaling and stress response over the last couple of decades to really start to understand how this, how this works in, 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 in real life for E. coli. So back to this MP1 strain, it was isolated from feces. And the great thing about this is that um, the Goulian lab isolated this strain um, by screening for, for a strain that would be genetically tractable. So a strain that would be you know, just out of an animal, but also would be really amenable to all the genetic tools we have. So this strain can be genetically man manipulated, just like our K12 strains that are domesticated. It's closely related to human E. coli commensals. And the Goulian lab developed um, red fluorescent and green fluorescent versions of this MP1 strain called MP7 and MP13, and they'll come up a lot in this talk, um, for the purpose of doing competition experiments with um, strains containing different mutations. Um, and then on the left here, you can see how well it's able to colonize, right? So if they temporarily disrupt the microbiome of the mouse with streptomycin, they can then take away the streptomycin, gavage in MP1 into these mice, and colonization is um, stable up to after 71 days, which was, I think, the last time that they, that they looked. So not only this, in this same study, the Goulian lab made mutations in either this red fluorescent MP7 or this green MP13 in each of these response regulator proteins um, that are involved in um, the control of all these two component systems. And then they competed each of those individual mutants with a wild type strain that was a different fluorescent label. And they asked which ones had colonization defects. And excitingly for us, there were three mutants with severe colonization defects that were completely not competitive with the wild type strain. And they all were affecting um, regulatory pathways that are linked to adaptations in the envelope. So one of these is the ARC pathway. One is R pathway, the CPX envelope stress response. And another one was in that other envelope stress response I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the RCS response. So just to remind you guys about, oh, sorry, oh dear. Okay, this is what happens when you have too many graphics in your slides and your computer doesn't like it. Wait for it, there we go. It's making the lipid bilayers. There's just too much complexity in those graphics. Um, so just to remind you about, about what those pathways do that when they were knocked out, they, uh, they really impacted the ability of, of these E. coli to colonize the mouse. So the CPX response, I've told you all about, this, this pathway um, responds to misfolded proteins, regulates a host of genes, but proteases and chaperones are a central part of this adaptation. RCS response that I mentioned earlier, again, is responsive to damage to LPS. And in response to that signal, it results in activation of genes for capsule which I've shown up here that kind of coats the bacterium in a protective polysaccharide goo. And then the ARC system over here is involved in sensing oxygen levels um, and mediating changes in the electron transport chain at the inner membrane. And in particular, what the ARC pathway does is when it detects that oxygen levels are dropping, it turns off the expression of aerobic electron transport chain components that use oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor. And so all of these mutants are defective in colonization. So now we're really excited about this. We have a good um, mouse commensal model to study. 
Um, and it, we know that it has this defect in colonization in these envelope adaptation pathways that we're very interested in. So this is when um, Kat Pick entered my lab as a biology 499 student. And Kat's project was to establish this system for looking at competition um, in my lab in vitro initially. And so what Kat did is she just recreated these ARC RCS or CPXR mutants in this green version of this mouse commensal, so MP13. And then she competed those individual mutants in a test tube against a red labeled wild type version of that mouse commensal MP1 that's called MP7. So she just grew them up together. Then she plated them out and she counted green and red um, colonies to see um, how that competition went. And so in all the competitions that Kat was doing, she, she kept getting the same result that this RCSB mutant was winning. And this was confusing to us because as I just showed you, in the mouse colonization model, the RCSB mutant is very defective in colonization. So we didn't understand what this was, um, but Kat hypothesized that maybe it is a difference between the in vitro competition that we're doing and the in vivo mouse colonization assay that the Goulian lab published. So Kat was really curious about this and she set out to figure out why this mutant was always winning in competition. And so the first um, question she asked was whether or not this mutant was secreting some toxic substance that was killing the other microbe. And so to get at the answer to that, she just grew up this RCSB mutant, she grew up the wild type, and she pelleted the, the mutant cells and took that supernatant and applied it to a lawn of this wild type MP7 bacterial culture. And at high concentrations, what she saw was complete clearing. But when she diluted that um, supernatant down, she started to see these um, zones of clearing or plaques which are really indicative of bacteriophage or bacterial viruses. So here's where I veer hard into bacteriophage. So I just wanted to um, remind everybody about how these work. So um, as I said, they're, they're viruses that infect bacterial cells. We call them bacteriophage or sometimes just phage. Um, and the interesting thing about bacteriophage is that they can grow in two different kinds of life cycle. So in one of these life cycles, they, it's just kind of what we think about viruses, right? They infect a cell, they inject their genome, they produce more progeny phage parts, assemble them, um, burst the cell and release a lot more phage. And so this is, this is what we call the lytic cycle. And um, there are some bacteriophage that are only lytic. Other bacteriophage called temperate um, have another option. So they can infect a host cell, inject their genome, but um, these temperate bacteriophage have a choice. They, they can grow lytically, or sometimes they will integrate their genome into the bacterial chromosome, where we call it a prophage. Um, and then we call the, the bacterium containing that prophage a lysogen. And then that, that, that bacteriophage genome can be propagated indefinitely as part of the bacterial chromosome, until some kind of a stress is encountered that causes the, the bacteriophage genome to excise from the chromosome and re-enter lytic growth. And then the whole thing can happen all over again. So that's, those are some um, phage facts for you. So Kat suspected she was looking at a phage. So the first thing that she did is she just examined the supernatant of this mutant um, using negative staining and transmission electron microscopy. And she saw these uniform um, icosahedral heads with short tails that are kind of classic morphology indicative of the Podoviridae family. Um, and so Kat, at this point, was starting to ask the question of whether that competition phenotype that she had seen was due to this RCSB mutation or whether it was just an effect of, of this bacteriophage that um, was associated with this strain. And so she went back to all the original strains that we had gotten from the Goulian lab. So the unlabeled MP1, the green fluorescent labeled MP13 and the red fluorescent labeled MP7 that are all wild type now. There's no other mutations in them. 
and she screened their supernatants for killing activity um, and, and also screened them in competition experiments. And what she found is that MP1 and MP13, where she had made her mutants, both produced this phage killing activity, whereas MP7, which is the strain that she happened to choose as her wild type, um, did not. And so at this point, we concluded that the phenotype she was seeing in those competition assays was due to the production of this phage and not to the mutation she had introduced that, that was knocking out the envelope stress response. So by now, Kat is really curious about this phage that she has visualized um, and identified as being involved in killing. Um, and it was also a little bit unusual because it was clear from the experiments that Kat was carrying out that this phage is liberated just naturally from these bacteria during growth. And Kat figured that it was a temperate phage because she could grow up these cultures of MP1 and MP13 fine. Like, they didn't lice the way that you might expect them to if there was just lytic phage production going on. So she reasoned that, you know, perhaps this is a, a temperate bacteriophage residing in the chromosomes of these two strains. So to begin to ask whether that was true, she used um, a, a bioinformatic program developed right here at the U of A with input from uh, someone I know really well in our department called FASTER to scan the genome of the, the published genome of MP1 for prophage elements. And she found six potential prophage elements, only one that was judged to be intact um, and set about screening these prophage elements to determine which one might correlate with this phage that she had seen um, by electron microscopy. And so to do that, Kat designed um, primers to genes within each of these prophage regions. And then she PCR'd either genomic DNA or she isolated phage stocks. So um, phage lysates just really packed with bacteria phage, but lacking any bacteria and treated them with DNAs and then did PCR on those. And so you can see that all of the genomic DNA um, amplifies with primers that amplify genes specific to those prophage regions that were detected. Um, but when she looked at um, phage lysates, only one of these um, primer pairs amplified a region and it only amplified a region from MP13. And so that one PCR product um, corresponded to, oops, sorry, I went too far this intact, predicted intact bacteriophage that was detected with FASTER. Okay, so Kat went on to sequence the whole genome um, of, of all of the strains that we had, MP7, MP13, and MP1. And she, could, she uh, isolated this phage from the strains where you would predict it to be, annotated its genome um, and demonstrated that it is a, a novel genus and species of Podoviridae. And it's present, um, as I said before, in MP1 and MP13, but not in MP7. Um, she showed that it was a temperate phage and she identified the insertion site in the bacterial chromosome um, as occurring in this ARGW gene, uh, which is a, a tRNA locus in a hypervariable region of the E. coli chromosome. And she went on to do some taxonomy and showed that, again, this is a novel Podoviridae. It had less than 60% sequence similarity to any other characterized Podoviridae genus. Um, and with the, the virus or the bacteriophage that was most related to it, it's called um, SF101. And you can see kind of this big green chunk here that demonstrates an area of conservation. Um, this is the, the virion morphogenesis module that's the most conserved. The rest of it is um, relatively novel. Okay, and again, in looking at taxonomy, she found that it was most closely related to phage P22 and from Salmonella and this SF101 phage from Shigella. Okay, so there's Cappy1 and then kind of all of its kind of close, closest relatives. Okay, so... 
Um, now we are really excited about this project that took us completely off in a different direction from envelope stress responses because we have a good commensal strain of E. coli that colonizes the mouse well. And we've identified a novel bacteriophage that is a resident of this um, microbe. And so this got us looking and cat looking specifically at the literature around um, bacteriophage and gut microbes. And what Kat discovered is, first of all, I, I, I mentioned in my introduction how prevalent bacteria are in every environment on Earth. Bacteriophage or the phagosphere is just beginning to be characterized, but um, it's estimated that there will be many magnitudes more bacteriophage um, in, in our world than there are bacteria. So they're, they're going to be everywhere. 50% um, of the sequenced bacterial genomes contain prophages. And these prophage elements integrated into the bacterial chromosome are enriched in intestinal bacteria. And in Enterobacteriaceae, they are found in all of them. So this suggests, sorry, May, this suggests to us that lysogeny or the carriage of these prophages plays an important role in colonization of the gut. Um, and then also interestingly, these lysogens, there's been a few studies of um, bacterial lysogens out there demonstrating that um, just carrying a prophage can alter the physiology of the host and confer increased stress resistance, increased growth rate and altered biofilm formation. So Kat set out to investigate um, this bacteriophage um, host interaction with this MP1 commensal isolate um, thinking that they're, you know, we're really, again, excited to use this as a model to uncover kind of some new paradigms behind how this relationship happens, how it affects the host and how that impacts colonization. So what Kat showed right away when she started looking um, and comparing the, the wild type non-lysogen to the lysogen carrying CAPI-1, which is what she called her phage. The first thing she noticed is that, um, the presence of the phage leads to decreased growth, um, especially in the stationary phase of growth, and it's more variable. And Kat speculated that this was because um, in this stationary phase, this is when these bacteriophage are, are being released. And so she checked that by, again, um, measuring both the loss of CAPI-1 lysogens in this stationary growth phase, as well as the production of um, virions. Sorry, my, uh, I'm just gonna get that, this out of my way. Sorry, I have you guys' faces in the wrong place. Oop, and that's the wrong thing. Okay, um, yeah, and she also, she also measured plaque forming units at stationary phase. And she found that um, there's about 0 0.03 plaque forming units per colony forming unit at stationary phase. So these um, lysogens are liberating phage and that's causing them to have a slower, more variable growth rate. So it is impacting the physiology of, of its E. coli host. Um, so I mentioned that bacteriophage have also been shown to impact stress adaptation. And so given that cat's CAPI-1 phage is released in stationary phase, Kat asked if there was any impact on the major stationary phase stress response um, conferred by integration of that phage into the bacterial genome. And so to do that, she looked at levels of expression of this transcription factor called sigma S, which is sensitive to nutrient deprivation and various stresses that happen during stationary phase growth. Um, its, its expression gets dramatically increased and it leads to the upregulation of factors that lead to broad cross resistance to these stresses. And so Kat created a luminescent reporter gene where she had the promoter of this RPOS gene encoding sigma S fused to the LUX A through E genes that make a bioluminescent um, protein complex. And she showed in wild type cells in stationary phase that RPOS levels increase as expected um, but in the lysogen carrying the prophage in the chromosome, these levels were even higher. So carriage of the prophage is altering growth rate and it's also altering the stress response in this E. coli host. Uh, and then the last piece I'll show you uh, around um, how the host biology is altered is, is the LPS. And so other phages um, 
engage in this lysogenic conversion where when they incorporate their genome into a bacterial genome, they express genes that alter the LPS that coats the surface of that microbe. And that um, acts to prevent further phage infection and kind of preserve the prophage integrated into that genome. And so Kat, again, isolated LPS from her wild type and her CAPI-1 lysogen. And then she ran it on an SDS page gel and silver stained it. You can see that there are, are, are differences um, between them. And over here is just sort of a cartoon of the LPS molecule. And essentially what Kat showed is that when the CAPI-1 phage is integrated into the chromosome, the LPS of its host organism um, is shortened in that these polysaccharide O antigens are not as long as they are in the wild type. And we think this could have real significance to interaction with uh, an animal host, since as, as we all know, LPS interacts with the immune response, it interacts with other bacteriophage, and it's really important for the barrier function of the outer membrane of bacteria. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish off by telling you about the latest experiments we've done that um, to investigate whether or not any of these changes in physiology that cats identified um, or carriage of this phage alter um, gut colonization. And so to begin with, Kat asked this in vitro, and she did this by just um, growing up lysogens and non-lysogens in LB or in media that mimics intestinal fluid or gastric fluid. Um, and, and then she looked at what happens to um, phage production um, and what happens to the presence of lysogens that are carrying CAPI-1. And so what she found is, as I showed you before in LB, there are phage shed in, in stationary phase, and this corresponds with a loss of CAPI-1 lysogens. So they're losing that prophage. It's being induced and, and leaving the chromosome. Um, in gastric fluid, mimicking the gastric uh, situation, there was little change from the LB situation. But in intestinal fluid, CAT saw a, a big decrease in the production of plaque forming units and a corresponding decrease in um, the presence of lysogens, indicating that perhaps in the intestinal environment, CAPI-1 carriage is being selected for. Um, the, the bacteria don't seem to be releasing as many plaque forming units or, or um, losing as many lysogens. And CAT did competition experiments in vitro by combining, uh, again, the CAPI-1 lysogen with a different colored um, non-lysogen. And she could show that by 48 hours in the lab, in both LB and intestinal simulated intestinal fluid, um, the CAPI-1 lysogen pretty much takes over the culture. And there is an even bigger, um, an even bigger benefit to the lysogen in the simulated intestinal fluid. Again, maybe arguing that in the environment of the intestine, this prophage is, is beneficial. And so the very last experiment I will show you is a, a collaboration that we just started with um, Ben Willing and Ting Ting Zhu in Ailes to ask whether or not um, these things that we are seeing in the lab with this phage apply to um, E. coli in an animal host. And so with, with uh, Ben and Ting Ting, who we convinced to come along on this uh, collaboration, we infected pathogen-free mice that still contain a microbiome, although it's free from E. coli. Um, we gavaged them with either the wild type or the CAPI-1 lysogen alone, and showed that there was really no change in their ability to colonize the mouse intestine as measured by bacteria and feces. However, when we mixed these two together in a competition experiment, at zero days, you can see we start with kind of much more of the non-lysogen than the CAPI-1 lysogen. We suspect this might be due to early liberation of phages by, by the CAPI-1 lysogen. But by day 14, um, the CAPI-1 lysogen, again, has pretty much uh, taken over the colonization and makes up the majority of the microbes that we, we detect in, in the feces of the mice. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I went a little longer than I wanted to, but I'll just wrap up with this slide and, and 
I'll tell you what I've told you about this story. So um, I've told you that we, we've identified a new bacteriophage, a novel bacteriophage that infects this commensal organism that colonizes the guts of mice. Um, we have shown that when that phage exists as a prophage in the chromosome, it leads to modifications to the host E. coli. It alters the O antigen, which could impact interaction with the host. Um, or other bacteriophages. It results in an altered growth rate um, and it alters the stress response, which is, which is not shown here. So we think these, these differences are important for in vivo colonization as indicated by these early mouse experiments. And we are really excited to go forward and ask all kinds of um, questions that follow up on these observations about what the role of this, this prophage is in colonization of the mammalian intestine and what this can tell us maybe about the phage host interaction and how it might impact colonization of, of um, hosts. Okay, so just before I stop there and ask if there are any questions, I have to do another couple thank yous to end my talk. So I, I really have to thank the Dennis Lab, and this is a, a picture of the Dennis Lab and the Rivio Lab at a holiday party the last time we were able to get together in a big group like this, which I think was Christmas 2019. Um, they, <laughs> of course, have been studying bacteriophage for much longer than us, and they've been very generous with their expertise and their tools in helping us go down this path. Um, and I have to thank John and Benji and Zach. Uh, these are my people and they have kept me sane during the pandemic and I wouldn't want to be in a pandemic with anyone else. So uh, I'm going to try and stop there. <laughs> now I have to figure out how to use my Zoom. And I will be happy to answer any questions at all or try to. <laughs> if anyone's still there. <laughs> thank you, thank you. The sounds of silent Zoom clapping. <laughs> um, okay, now I have to watch for people to put their hands up or, or just speak. Hi, Tracy, is Heather here? Hi, Heather. I, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say hi. And hi. I to say that uh, this is helpful because I'll be doing my biology 108 lectures on uh, bacteria soon. And it's good to Excellent. get a little refresher uh, about oh, them and bacteriophages. So I now don't have to study so much. Thank you. Excellent. I'm glad I could provide a primer. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. It's nice to hear from you. Anybody else? Anything at all as long as it's not about the pandemic. <laughs> Declan. Hi, Tracy. Yeah, uh, great talk. I mean, you know, it, it's not my field, so a lot of it was sort of over my head, but uh, but some of it wasn't, and so that, that's pretty neat. Um, <laughs> I do have a question. So, you know, you mentioned that you see these changes in mice. What relevance do you see for humans down the road for this, or if any? Well, I mean, we know E. coli inhabits mammalian intestines. And so I'm, and we know that this isolate that we are using shares some similarity to human commensal E. coli. So my hope would be that a lot of what we are finding would be directly translatable to the human situation and colonization of the gut by um, E. coli species that, that live, in, live in our GI tracts. Um, yeah, I think I think I'll just leave it there. That that's that's our hope, and we hope by using this kind of simpler model system that we have, where we're starting with you know one bacterium and one phage, that maybe we can ask you know some some actual kind of cause and effect mechanism questions with this mouse model. So mm -hmm. that's the plan: is to kind of break down these very complex interactions that are happening inside of a gut with you know many, 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 many different kinds of bacteria and phages um, to look at, you know, one situation and hope that we can learn some things that apply to this more, more complex um, environment in the microbiome. 
I'm glad that some of it was was comprehensible. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, the chat is, uh, let's see, Olaf, can you explain the computational strategy to search for phages? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I knew someone was going to ask that, and I very briefly read about it, and I'll just preface my answer by saying that this is not my area of expertise, but uh, my understanding of it, and John can interrupt me if he's here and I'm getting this wrong, because he actually worked on the first version of this um, with the Wisher lab, I think. So my understanding is that it looks for um, a variety of things, but at the center of a lot of it are um, homologs to known bacteriophage genes. And then it also looks for multiple bacteriophage genes that are occurring together and the distance between them to identify bigger prophage regions. And I think that's the basic concept. But again, if John's here and he knows more about that, he can, he can chime in. Yeah, I'll chime in. Uh, okay. <laughs> that's essentially correct. Uh, we uh, looked at capsid tail fibers and tails and looked to see when they occurred, the genes occurred within a, a phage sized uh, area. And so that, uh, along with a lot of uh, modifications to that, and um, again, secondary searching for other phage genes that put together the idea that there would be a prophage in that area. And is Illumina sequencing good enough for that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great, thanks. Thanks, John. <laughs> John. The other, the other John. <laughs> hi, hi, Tracy. Um, I sort of came in late, uh, but anyway, I'm just, just sort of, this is something totally out of the left field because I'm not, not a microbiologist or anything, but I'm just, just thinking, you know, when you're doing some of these um, experiments by um, inoculating the gut in, in an animal and you see the competition and, and the, the up, you know, up regulation of one, but then the, the sort of dominance of the other, Oh, of one versus the other, would the, you know, the host gut and the, the host either immune or endocrine status affect that ratio? I am certain that it would, but I don't know the answer to your question. I think that's, those are kind of, those get right at the heart of the, of the kinds of things that we would like to know and that we would like to examine further, especially given that this prophage seems to alter LPS, which of course is, is an immune modulator and a key interaction point between bacteria and their hosts. Um, so I, I feel pretty confident saying that, you know, if you modulate some aspect of host immunity, you could impact um, how this competition goes. At this point, I mean, it's, it's all just hand waving and hypothetical, but that's the basic idea is that, you know, these prophages are impacting the physiology of the bacteria that's colonizing that animal. Um, and that's all part of this, you know, much more complex system that is interacting with the host and its immune response and other microbes. And um, so, yes, I, I think that would have, a, have an effect, but I can't tell you what it would be. <laughs> it's a great question to think about though. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> okay. Well, thanks everybody that's writing. Thanks for the comments in the chat. And thanks again, everybody for showing up. I am so glad that I wasn't, you know, in this room with three people giving my talk. That makes me feel uh, <laughs> really happy. So it was, it was great to see everybody um, and hear voices and good luck with the coming weeks. Uh, you'll be hearing more. <laughs> from me, most definitely. And um, actually, I'll just take a moment and thank everybody that's here for all the efforts that everyone is putting in with, with teaching right now and going the extra mile. I know it's not easy, and I know it feels like it's changing on a daily basis, which this week it is. Um, but I'm so appreciative of, of everybody's efforts and the thought that I've seen from people going into how they're doing their teaching and um, their consideration for the student situation and in delivering their curriculum. So thank you so much, everybody, for all of that. I appreciate it. And I hope to see you 
I don't even want to say when, but I hope to see you soon in person with beverages and snacks. <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm. <laughs>